Loser Takes All is a 1955 novella by British author Graham Greene. In his dedication Greene said he had not written, this little story, to encourage, adultery, the use of pajama tops, or registry office weddings. Nor is it meant to discourage gambling. Synopsis. Edit. Mr. Bertram and Carrie are about to get married. An unambitious assistant accountant, Bertram's plans for marriage are not particularly exciting. One day, he comes to the attention of Druther, the powerful director of his company, who changes Bertram's plan for him, they are to wed and honeymoon in Monte Carlo. Druther will meet the couple in Monte Carlo and be their witness, on board his private yacht. Bertram and Carrie arrive in Monte Carlo but Druther does not show up. The couple are therefore forced to stay there. Bertram is angry with Druther. In order to make sure they can pay the hotel bills, Bertram visits the casino. At first he loses, but gradually his system starts working, and he begins to win big money. He wins so much money that he gets the attention of Mr. Bowles, another director of the company gambling in Monte Carlo, who is also a rival of Druther. Bowles wants Bertram to lend him money. In exchange, Bertram wants Bowles' shares of the company, so that, in gaining control of the company, he will get his revenge on Druther. Meanwhile, Carrie is disappointed that Bertram becomes obsessed with his system. A romantic person, she does not want him to become rich. At this time, she meets a hungry young man who expresses his love for her. She decides to leave Bertram. Devastated, Bertram does not know what to do. He blames Druther for ruining his marriage. Just at this time, Druther arrives on his yacht. He explains that his no-show is not deliberate, he is only forgetful. Bertram, while still doubting Druther's sincerity, tells him about his trouble. The wise and well-meaning Druther then devises a plan that would help Bertram get Carrie back. The plan works perfectly, with Carrie coming back to him. Bertram is happy even though he loses all his money to Bowles thereby cancelling his deal with him and the hungry young man. Hence, it is, Loser Takes All. Losers Take All 2015, a young adult contemporary novel by David Class, follows a young boy and his friends who form an anti-athletics team and attract far more attention than they could ever expect. The book received generally positive reviews upon publication, and it was nominated for the 2017 Missouri Gateway Readers Award. Alongside writing novels, Class is also a well-respected Hollywood screenwriter who once preferred playing sports to reading books. During his time studying at Yale University, he won the Veatch Award for Best Imaginative Writing. The protagonist, Jack Logan, is a teenage boy who hates playing sports. This surprises his father, a local football legend known as the Logan Express. His brothers also perform very well in sports, Jack always feels like the oddball of the family. He's fast, but he doesn't care. He doesn't want to play. To make matters worse for Jack, he attends Freeman High, a sports-obsessed high school in New Jersey. All Jack wants is to live his own life, which will never involve playing sports. His friends at the school all feel the same way, and together, they do everything they can to stay on the sidelines. However, when the high school principal dies trying to break a track record, the local obsession with sports and athletic prowess only intensifies. The school votes in Mr. Maldinger is the new principal. He embodies everything the school stands for. He's the football team coach, and he's obsessed with athletic achievement. When he's not coaching, he's a member of the audiovisual department, which is essentially a non-teaching position. Everyone is convinced he's what the school needs after the principal's death. Jack, however, is not so sure. Things only get worse for Jack when Mr. Maldinger introduces a new policy, every senior must sign up for a sports team. As Jack is so fast, he's recruited to the varsity football team. They need a quick player to complete their roster. Jack's family is very proud he has been chosen. Horrified, Jack doesn't think it's fair. However, no one is prepared to listen to him. No one, that is, other than his friends at school. They tell him to give it a chance, though they agree it is completely unfair. Jack takes their advice and tries out for the football team, but he suffers a broken tooth during his first tryout. Jack has had enough, and he walks away from the football field. He decides that, if he must play sports, he'll form his own team, there's no rule against that. Jack's friends love his plan. Together, they set up the C soccer team. His girlfriend, Becca, joins too. They recruit Mr. Percy, a history teacher who hates sports, to be their coach. The team is made up of students who are either terrible at sports or do everything to avoid playing them. Mr. 
Percy understands their frustrations. Jack is the captain, which unsurprisingly, does not impress his family. When the team takes to the field, it's a disaster. The goalie falls asleep in the net, and the players stumble their way around the field. Mr. Maldinger, sensing that they're playing badly on purpose, is furious. Jack and his friends, however, find it amusing. Moreover, they're not the only ones. Someone filmed their disastrous football game and uploaded it to social media. It has attracted attention from both high school sports stars and the ones who can't play. Some students are angry that Jack and his team, now known formally as the losers, are mocking sports tradition and the value of high school football teams. Others think it's wrong that they're made to play sports at all, and they're standing up for students who don't fit in. Jack's father is outraged. He is ashamed that his son is bringing the school's name into disrepute, especially when he has so much sporting potential. For a time, this is almost enough to make Jack reconsider how his team plays, but he cannot sacrifice his own values just to impress his dad. Before their next game, one of the players, Rob, is badly beaten. The incident is filmed, and the perpetrators look like a team football players. This attracts more attention, and school kids everywhere are in an uproar. By the time the next game rolls around, the losers have attracted followers who attend the game to watch. The losers go from strength to strength, until finally, they play Linton High, a local team with an unbeaten record. It is the biggest game of the season, and college scouts will be there. The losers have no expectations, but Jack is such a talented player that many people believe they'll win. Mr. Maldinger is incensed that they're taking the limelight away from him and his a team, but there's nothing he can do about it. Ultimately, the losers tie with Linton High. Jack impresses a scout, and his father tells him that he's proud of all he achieved. When Jack goes to college, he'll leave behind a legacy, just like his father, only this time, it's a legacy which everyone can relate to and aspire to. Plot Summary Loser Takes All is narrated in the first person by Bertram, an accountant in a large industrial concern. Called in by the chief executive, the grand old man, Mr. Druther, to fix an accounting error. He lets slip that he is due to be married soon, whereupon the not-to-be-disobeyed boss invites him to get married in Monte Carlo before joining him on his yacht. His secretary will see to the details. So Bertram and his beloved Carrie travel to Monte Carlo, put up in the best hotel in town, and settle down to await Druther's yacht. But it doesn't show up. As the days pass their money runs low, they economize by skipping meals or eating coffee and rolls at a little cafe waiting for Druther to arrive, until the money runs out and they start running up bills at the hotel which they can't pay now they're trapped. Eventually, Bertram an accountant by training, a mathematician by instinct wonders if he can devise a system to beat the roulette tables at the casino. Slowly he is sucked in, gambling all their money, then borrowing more, then losing the borrowed cash, as the couple sink into unhappiness, bicker and argue. Until he wins, massively, his system works. But it is too late. He has lost his girl. Carrie is at first sarcastic about his daily commute to the casino, about his long hours at work, and wonders when he will retire. Bertram insists it's for their good as a couple, I'm working for both of us, darling. Their arguments escalate and eventually she spends an evening with a poor but handsome gambler they met on their first night. Meanwhile, Bertram's luck takes a further leap upwards when he meets the old boy who owns the controlling shares in the company he works for and who is losing heavily at the tables. The old boy asks him for a loan. There follows some hard bargaining, which concludes with Bertram offering him the money to gamble with, on condition that he is repaid and gets the controlling shares. He will hold the balance of power at his firm. He will be able to shaft old Druther for getting them into all this trouble. Thus this once unassuming accountant reaches a pinnacle of wealth and success and loses the only thing he cares for in the world, his wife. At this opportune moment, the grand old man's yacht hoves into view in the marina. Bertram meets him in the casino and is angered to realize Druther has completely forgotten who he is and what their arrangement was. But he is not the grand old man for nothing. Druther soothes Bertram, plies him with champagne and wine, and eventually the sad accountant breaks down and tells him the whole story. Aha! Druther helps him cook up a plan to recover his wife. Later that night Bertram goes to the little bistro where his wife now dines with the poor gambler and confronts them. He offers all his money to the gambler for just half an hour to talk to his wife. The gambler hesitates, then takes the opportunity to take the money and try out his system in preference to staying with Carrie. Off he goes to the casino leaving Carrie in tears. Men. 
Bertram takes his crying wife out to Druther's yacht, where she is wined and dined and soothed by Druther. When they retire to their cabin, Bertram explains he has given away all the money he won. They are now back to where they began, untainted by wealth. In fact, Druther has, maybe from guilt, offered Bertram a promotion, so they will be a little better off. Maybe they'll be able to afford a holiday in Eastbourne next year. Carrie is reconciled, their love revives. But what about your deal with the rich shareholder? His wife asks. Bertram tears it up and throws it out the porthole. Let's start over again. Happy ending. And for once a Graham Green story allows you to draw your own conclusions about money, gambling, big business, love and so on. Computers and Original Sin At the start of the story, when Bertram is called in to find and correct the mistake in the accounts, he realizes it was caused by a glitch in the computers the firm uses. 1. It's interesting that computers are familiar enough to be used in a fiction from 1955. 2. It's funny that as soon as they're being used, they are a byword for error. 3. But most revealingly, it's typical of Green that, when writing a little paragraph summing up how pleased with himself Bertram feels, he slips in a bit of Catholic theology. Very possibly he's making a joke at his own expense, but it does seem typical of the technique of most of his fiction that at every point he is looking to slip in Catholic theology because it adds a spurious depth and intellectual coherence to what are otherwise often trivial incidents. I sat back on the sofa with a gasp of triumph. I felt the equal of any man. It had really been a very neat piece of detection. So simple when you knew, but everyone before me had accepted the perfection of the machine and no machine is perfect, in every joint, rivet, screw lies original sin. Penguin paperback edition, page point two three. Maybe it's not even that calculating. Maybe Green himself genuinely saw original sin all around him, in every aspect of human lives, and it therefore appears naturally in his fictions. J.R.R. Tolkien was a devout Roman Catholic. Tom Shippey's book about him explains that when Tolkien had finished The Lord of the Rings, he went back through it and carefully cut anything which even hinted at a spiritual or religious dimension. The less religion, the greater the imaginative impact. As if he trusted the liberated imagination to lead towards belief. Green has no such trust. Apart from the explicitly Catholic novels, where religion plays a crucial part in the plot, the power and the glory, the heart of the matter, the end of the affair, many of his other novels would benefit from pruning the casual references to God, original sin and so on which distract and even irritate the reader. It would focus our attention more on the story and less on the author's editorializing, giving them greater artistic integrity, making them more imaginatively effective. Sources Internet, 